a part of the British Sky Broadcasting Network. This week on NHRA Today, the Bernstein boys do battle at the Brickyard, while trucks take to the track in the Tar Heel State, relocating with a fast-moving funny car driver and hitting the high school show car circuit. From Bob Jenkins Race Cars in New Egypt, New Jersey, these stories and more on this edition of NHRA Today. For pure excitement, nothing can touch the thrill of watching a pair of fire-breathing jet bunny cars rocketing down the quarter mile. Their unlikely blend of automotive and aeronautic technology creates an incredibly fast and powerful machine that slips through the air more like an F-16 than a bunny car. One racer who is now moving into the next level of evolution is Al Hanna, a former top fuel racer who for the last few years has successfully campaigned a jet bunny car. Known for his innovative approach, and his hybrid race cars are definitely different and definitely winners. Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of NHRA Today. I'm Steve Evans and we're coming to you from the New Jersey countryside in the chassis shop of Bob Jenkins, where the latest work in progress is a revolutionary and evolutionary jet funny car for Al and Ellen Hanna. And that is not it. But take a look at their current car, a mental picture if you will, to better appreciate the machine we're going to show you in the next half hour. Plus, we'll have a profile on 240 Gordy Bonin, who desperately needs a tune-up on his nickname, and some sportsman action from the Tar Heel State. But first, as is our custom, let's find out what's hot. 300 mile an hour expectations were high at the recent Mopar Parks Nationals. With cooler weather conditions and two night qualifying sessions, we asked what it would take to reach the coveted triple century mark. If you're already going about 250 at the eighth mile, then you only got to gain another 50 in that last eighth, but you've only got about one and a half seconds to do it in. And uh, then you have to have eight strong cylinders running right to the finish line. If, if, if you lose any of them just a few feet before the finish line and the power falls off, it'll just knock off that mile or two, you know, and you just can't quite make it. While the English Town Pro shattered virtually every elapsed time track record, believe it or not, the only 300 mile per hour pass came courtesy of Joe Amato in a round one losing effort against Michael Brotherton. And that's what's hot. All jet funny cars are built along these same lines, with the driver sitting offset to the left alongside the huge jet engine and an air inlet that is very necessary, but it certainly spoils the lines of the body with Al's new car, which I promise we'll show you real quick like you can forget all of this. Right now, let's go back a week to Indianapolis, Indiana, where drag racing superstar Kenny Bernstein prepared to field half a six-pack of Indy cars. Carrying the bright red colors of Budweiser into action at the Brickyard last Sunday were three experienced veterans. Roberto Guerrero, last year's pole sitter, Jim Crawford, who ran the fastest lap in the history of the Speedway in 1992, and Al Unser Sr., a four-time winner of the 500. Operating such an ambitious effort has proven to be difficult. It's a major undertaking. It's a mammoth job to run three cars, three drivers, all the engine preparation and the chassis and everything. It's, it's been very difficult and very hard. It's not been an easy process at all. Just as in drag racing, Kenny has top-notch equipment. All three cars are 1993 Lolas powered by Chevy engines. He's put a team together that uh that has the best of everything. And that's, that's the one thing you notice, that he's a racer's racer. If there's something going to make the car a tenth of a mile an hour faster, we've got it in here. Al Luncer, who has driven for such owners as Parnelli Jones and Roger Penske, has high praise for his current boss. It's because he's a true racer. You know, it doesn't make any difference whether you, what kind of racing you're in. He knows what it takes and he knows what it's about. A constant problem for the team during the entire month was the difficulty in setting up three cars. We were hoping uh, all the drivers would be able to kind of help each other and whatever, and it ended up that with the different driving styles, uh, everybody's kind of have to go on their own way with the setup. So it's just put a lot of strain on the mechanics and on the engines and on everything. So it, it hasn't been easy. Some familiar faces to drag racing fans were there on race day as Dale Armstrong and crew joined the three-team throng. 
on race day there'll be 57 people involved in this program for the three teams. Uh, during the month of May there's been at least 40 to 42 or three all the time working on all three cars and doing it. The race was an up and down affair for the team. Jim Crawford struggled after an early spin while Al Unser ran near the front and led briefly. But the real fireworks for the team came when Roberto Guerrero crashed while trying to pass Jeff Andretti. Once the grueling 500 miles concluded, the highest finisher on the Bernstein team was Al Unser in 12th place, bringing an end to a fast but frustrating month. I think this will be the last time that we'll run three, but uh, we'll certainly be back next year. That's today. This is tomorrow. Al Hanna, what a gorgeous and revolutionary Jet Funny Car design. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, it's not that we created the uh, wheel ourselves. We looked to the Air Force for some advice, and what we've done is put the driver of the Jet Funny Car really where the Air Force puts the pilot in front of the engine. In addition to that, in order to do that, we had to create a very unique air inlet system in order to feed the air to the engine that this, this car needs. Setting that far forward, will it be harder to drive? No, we think it's going to be much better. We've actually cut the body and lengthened it. We have a 135-inch car. We're really looking forward to running this car. We'll talk to Al a little bit more, but right now, let's get up close and personal with Gordy Bonin. For Jody and Gordy Bonin, moving seems to be as much a part of their life as drag racing is. I've moved too many times. I mean, uh, Jody and I have been married four years now, and, and uh, we've, we've moved probably every year and a half. Their latest move from Seattle was facilitated not only by Roland Leong teaming up with Gordy to campaign the Hawaiian Vacation Funny Car, but also by Jody's appointment to the NHRA's Corporate Hospitality Manager position. I had about 36 hours to make a decision, and once I made it, every, all the wheels went in motion, and we just kind of went for it. And I flew into L.A. and found a place. And I flew home from Rockingham the day she started with NHRA, the day... Uh, the day after the race and I packed up the dog and cat in my car and sent the movers south and here we are. You might say it's a double reunion of sorts. Gordy worked for NHRA's marketing department in the 80s and was with Roland Leong several years before that. I drove his car 20 years ago. It's like coming around full circle racing for Roland again, racing with him. It's been a real special relationship. He's just, uh, he's good people. He's very shy. Uh, he believes horsepower will speak for itself. And with Leonard Hughes' expertise in tuning, the Hawaiian vacation horsepower is there. The first burnout in the funny, back in the funny car after 11 years in Phoenix, uh, on the way to Houston, uh, was like, damn, we can drive these things. This, this feels real good. Get back, Leonard says, don't have to do them burnouts quite so long. <laughs> uh, no, it just, it feels great. And uh, it's a real rush. I mean, 289, my second pass in this car. I want more now, right now. It's not as if Gordy isn't accustomed to breakneck speeds. After all, back in 1979, he set the record at Indy at 246 miles an hour, ran his first five en route to winning the race, and also earned the nickname 240 Gordy. Prudhomme was the first car, I think it was the Army car, he was the first car to run over 240 miles an hour. We were second, but then we did it everywhere we went. I mean, I, would, I never was one to lift till, till we got to the finish line. I mean, it felt too good, and it still does. It was probably Bill Doner or Evans that, that, that hung the name on us, because uh, number one, 240 Don Prudhomme didn't rhyme, 240 Gordy did, and I guess it kind of stuck. And now for Gordy, sometimes the hardest pace to keep up with is that of his wife. She's a dynamo. As, uh, I mean, when, you know, I'm 40-something, she's 30-something. I mean, you gotta, you got to really uh, push to stay ahead of her, I'll tell you that. Wow, Gord's like director of adrenaline. I can't keep up with him. If I'm a dynamo, he's definitely out of my league. He's just really happy right now. Our whole life is... It's just been magic all year. Yeah, I'm pretty high on life right now, but I've always been high on drag racing for what it's done for so many people and, and the people that we're attracting. And it's just gotten better and better and better and bigger and bigger. It's been a great life. Bob Jenkins is building the new funny car, and uh, what is the biggest challenge in Al's jet design? Uh, the biggest challenge here is uh, building this air inlet system. Uh, it, this is the mold, and... Uh, uh, this is a piece of the air inlet. It's made out of carbon fiber, and uh, the inside is a uh, DuPont Kevlar. 
a lot of man hours in this? Uh, there's over 250 man hours in just the, the actual mold itself, not counting building the inlet. Prostack bike competitors all wear handmade, highly tailored leather suits for protection. Looking good, John Myers. But they also wear an out-of-the-box Simpson super band helmet. What's about to change? It's a brand new helmet from Simpson, custom designed just for riders like John Myers. Notice here how they've cut the back of the helmet up. Okay, this little indentation across here. And also knows how they have raised the window. John, put this on and we'll show them exactly why this has been created just for you special people. Okay, now as John assumes the riding position after he's left the starting line, tucked down in, now there is no discomfort right in here before the helmet dug into his neck. And also with the eye port, he's not seeing the top of the helmet, okay? He's seeing right through his windscreen. Good work, guys. Amongst the wood. Welcome back, everyone, to the wilds of New Jersey. Alan Hanna can show us exactly what the new car will look like come early July. You excited? Yes, Steve. I'm excited about the new wave for the new jets and also uh, for my sons. The younger one drives, the older one is a jet engineer, and my grandson. Now, what impact do you think this car could have on jet racing as we know it? Well, Steve, this is a truly unique and different car. It has a stealth look, as you know. Uh, the intake system is different, the driver position. We think the performance is going to match the appearance. It'll run high 30s, low 40s at 290 miles an hour plus. What if someone else built one like it? Well, we encourage that. We encourage all the jet car guys in the country to step up to another level. We hope we're leading the way, and we hope everybody pays attention to us. I think they will. Right now, let's check in with Bob Fry. He has a sportsman report from North Carolina. The Division II racers spent their Memorial Day weekend at Coastal Plains Dragway in Jacksonville, North Carolina competing in the third race of the six-event Winston Drag Racing Series for the Rebel Racers. Usually, when you think of seeing a truck on the NHRA tracks, you think of that world-famous NHRA safety safari. But that's not always the case. As a matter of fact, we have one truck that's not only been on the track, but he's already won on the Winston Drag Racing Series level. It was at this race two years ago, Raymond King drove his V6 Dodge Dakota truck into the NHRA history book with a win in stock eliminator. It was really exciting. I, I didn't realize until after the race, really, that I was the first truck to win a race. But uh, I don't think anything you could, you know, that could have been said to me could have made me any more excited. King was introduced to professional drag racing at an early age to a relative by the name of Billy Meyer. Billy arranged a summer job for Raymond, working on Gene Snow's pit crew. I spent two summers while I was in high school working on his crew, and just kind of starting the ground up and cleaning the trailer and. And uh, doing, I was the bottom man on the engine, and I really got hooked on it. Even though he's raced cars in several eliminators, Raymond finds racing a truck in stock to be the most challenging. You find your gains, your performance gains, just literally just hundreds of a second at a time. It, it becomes a, a, a lot of a thinking game. And the people that can do well in stock, uh, they got their ducks in a row. Now, we work at a little bit of a deficit because this pickup truck's got more front-end weight than just probably about any car that's out here, but it, it hadn't seemed to adversely affect how we've been able to, to run. Ironically, during Sunday's eliminations, Raymond was defeated by Donald Barnes, the racer that he beat two years ago for that historic win. In the stock final, division-leading Harold Culpepper increased his lead by defeating Sterling Simmons in the near lane. Sterling broke out by a thousandth, but I had him on the tree a little bit, so that really helped. It was all smiles in the Coastal Plains winner's circle, and now here are the rest of the winners from Division Two. For NHRA Today, I'm Bob Fry. Did you know that jet funny cars use the same cross-form parachute as nitro or alcohol funny cars? Only they stuff them inside these aluminum tubes instead of the conventional pack. They also use shroud lines twice as long to keep the canopy away from the hot exhaust. Here now is Frank Hawley with this week's Fast Fact. You guessed it, it's on the effects of parachutes. Earlier this year, we talked about the spectacular plus 5G acceleration these top fuel dragster drivers feel when they leave the starting line. But what a lot of people don't realize is that these cars actually stop harder than they leave the starting line when the chutes open. As a driver approaches the finish line, 
He reaches for the parachute levers a few hundred feet before he actually gets to the finish line. Then, as he approaches the finish line, he pushes the parachute levers and closes the throttle at the same time. Now he's in for a spectacular stopping force. As we can see on the monitor, this is the accelerometer graph from Michael Brotherton's top fuel dragster. This line represents zero G as he sits on the starting line. When he applies the throttle, it immediately jumps up to close to five Gs. The further he goes down the racetrack, the less the acceleration of the car, although the faster the car's going. But right here, that's the finish line, that's where he closes the throttle and the chute's open. The graph goes negative right off the bottom of the scale. In fact, these cars can stop at about negative seven Gs. That means that a 200 pound driver feels like he weighs about 1,400 pounds. You don't want to have loose seat belts when those chutes open. Now, some of the drivers that have had neck or back problems actually elect to only use one parachute on the tracks that are longer and allows them a softer stop so that they don't hurt themselves. But if you go 290 or 300 miles per hour and the opening of the parachutes coincides perfectly with the closing of the throttle, you're in for a negative 7G stop and it just about rips your head off. But you get used to it. Like a lot of drag racers, Al Hanna often takes his car to high schools to encourage kids to stay in school and stay off drugs. And boy, he is a star performer. But recently, we visited a high school in New Jersey where the students' own cars were the stars. Car shows are commonplace across the U.S., but in Homedale, New Jersey, we found a new twist on an old favorite. Get to see what kind of works on your friends' cars and how much they really care about them and if they do care about them or not. The 30 entries were voted on by both teachers and students of Homedale High and middle schools. In its fourth year, the brainchild of power mechanics teacher John Ravalli has grown to include classic and contemporary categories in a recently added stereo competition. I figured I'd enter because, you know, uh, I had a unique sound system. And I figured it'd be fun. Frankie, you installed this whole thing, right? built the box too. You built that in class. We use it as an educational experience and hopefully an experience that teaches them how to respect vehicles rather than just to jump in a car and then punch it and go. The show cars range from a 1992 Lincoln with remote everything. Wait, you started for it first. Watch that. To a VW bug going by, who else? I'm a clown and this is a clown car, so. I like to be different, and it's different. From new vehicles to those painstakingly restored as hobbies and during class. You learn so many things I never knew about cars, you know, you know how to fix cars, and you know, now I can look at a car and know exactly what's wrong with it, if something's wrong with it, so it's, it's a great class. I always love cars. I love, I love working on cars, looking at cars. So my uncle's getting rid of this, and what a waste. So I took it, and then at power class, I learned how to work on it even better. Trophies were awarded for first, second, and third place, but there were no losers involved with this project. Well, as you can see with the body off, the carbon fiber ductwork was a huge challenge for builder Bob Jenkins, but he did it, and we've done it. For all of us here at NHRA Today, I'm Steve Evans. NHRA Today is a presentation of Diamond B Sports.